Let's open in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 this morning. We're just going to be looking at three verses, verses 20 through 23. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 20. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness <coughs> about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So I give heed to the message and gain understanding. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, we pray that you would help us to also give heed, to gain understanding, to have hearts that are open, minds that are undistracted, that we might hear from you, that we might learn and, and grow as a result of your word. Help me to proclaim it clearly. Give me your power and wisdom as I speak, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever wondered why some people experience incredible answers to prayer and seem to be supremely blessed by God, while others don't? We are on the verge of studying one of the most significant prophecies in all of Scripture. And once again, it came to Daniel, a man who from his youth has seen God prosper him in all that he's done. He's been miraculously protected from ferocious lions. He's been able to interpret prophetic visions and dreams as well as receive them regarding the future. Why Daniel? The answer to that is a principle that is repeated often in Scripture and is clearly manifested in the life of Daniel, and that is this, that God greatly blesses those who faithfully live for him and fervently pray to him. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 23, it clearly demonstrates this truth as it's really going to transition us from the prayer closet of Daniel to the prophetic revelation that Daniel receives as a part of the answer to his prayer. Today we're not going to get into the details of the amazing prophecy of the 70 weeks that begins uh, being explained in verse 24, but we're going to focus on the truth about Daniel and how and why he received this prophecy from verses 20 through 23. Unlike many other times when he received a vision or even at times was simply interpreting a dream someone else had, here, Daniel is given a personal visit from Gabriel. And in that visit, he then has explained this great prophecy. And it's clear from our passage that that visit is in direct response to the prayer that he utters in verses 1 or in verses 4 through 18 of this chapter. And so as we listen to their conversation... Again, we see this great principle of James 5, 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. We see this principle as we first look at some of the details about Daniel's praying. Verses 20 through 21. Daniel's about to experience the ultimate interruption of prayer anyone has ever experienced. We've all had prayer times interrupted. In various ways. More recently, my prayer time when I'm home often gets interrupted by two very large cats who don't seem to want to ever leave me alone. But what an interruption this is here as the angel Gabriel comes to him in response to his prayer. As we look at this, first notice the summary description of his humble praying in verse 20. While I, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God. Good things will happen for God's people when they pray. And Daniel's been doing that as we looked at last week as we walked through this, this prayer that Daniel was praying for his people. 
We see it described here. We're reminded of the humble character that Daniel had as he talks about praying and confessing his sin and the sin of his people. We noted last week that really none of the none of the really um, judgments and things that were happening to Israel were, were on behalf of Daniel's sin. He wasn't living in apostasy like the nation was. He wasn't living, he wasn't worshiping idols like the nation was. And yet his first focus as he prayed, starting at verse 5, and then again repeated here in verse 20, is his sin. We all have sin, even though Daniel has never had any sin lapses recorded in Scripture. It doesn't mean he wasn't a sinner. Obviously he was. We all are. And so regardless of how godly a person is, how, regardless of how um, serious they might be in their walk with God, they need to be conscious of sin and humbly repentant of that sin. What a great pattern this is for us as we pray. We should always be beginning our our prayer time with personal reflection, with a humble reflection of our own sin and confession of sin. And if you can't think of any particular sins at that time, just confess the sins you know you have, even if you don't know what they are, just the fact that you're a sinner and, and just be in humble uh, relationship to God. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Why was Daniel blessed? Why did God answer his prayers? Why did God entrust him with the kind of prophetic visions and opportunities that he had? Well, certainly, it begins with having a humble spirit. God gives grace to the humble. I've always been somewhat struck in a I don't know how else to say it, but with the first part of that statement in 1 Peter 5, 5, that God opposes the proud. And I've often thought to myself, how often have I or, and others um, actually invited God's opposition to our spiritual lives? Not only do we see the summary description of his humble praying, we see the fervent perseverance of his praying in verse 21 while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness. Verse 20 emphasizes the constant, unceasing nature of his prayer. Verse 21 demonstrates the fervency of his prayer as well. Verse 20, we see these, these terms, I was speaking and praying and confessing. It emphasizes a constancy, not just a short little quick prayer and up and gone, but he's praying, and we don't know how long he'd been praying, but we see that he doesn't stop praying until suddenly Gabriel comes and interrupts him. And as he does that, Daniel describes himself as being in extreme weariness. Extreme weariness. Again, we don't know how long Daniel was praying on this occasion, but what we do know is that Gabriel's visit came in the afternoon. It came in the evening sacrifice, which literally would have been 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We also know that his engagement in prayer left him physically and spiritually exhausted. Fervency in prayer is intense, and it engages one in spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You could bet that Daniel, as a man of prayer, as a man who was being blessed with all these different significant and important prophecies, intensely felt the the battle. Someone God responds to is someone Satan is going to oppose intensely, passionately. And when we are engaged in those spiritual battles, they're going to impact us. We don't know, you know, it's not like we know, oh, wow, I'm in a spiritual battle right now. Maybe sometimes you do, but, um, but this is real. This is something the Bible talks about often. 
We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And so we need to understand the more that we are doing for God, and certainly in the area of prayer, that is something Satan is going to attack us. I wonder this morning how often do we get so focused and intense and burdened in our prayer and our supplications that we have this kind of battle going on where it actually physically and spiritually wears us out. This is the kind of praying that God responds to, and this is the kind of person God responds to, someone who is fervent in his prayers. And that leads also to the incredible testimony that we read here in verse 23 from Gabriel. Gabriel says, at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for, I, for you are highly esteemed. Literally in the Hebrew, you are a precious treasure. You might have that interpretation or something like that in your, in your version, treasure. You are highly treasured or highly esteemed. Can you imagine God thinking that way about you? That you are highly esteemed? And the holy God of the universe, the one who, with whom there is no sin, thinking that you are a treasure? And the question is, does he think this way about all of us? You might be tempted to answer yes, but I'm not asking you if he loves all of us. That is yes, but does he think? For Gabriel to point out that he is highly esteemed would imply to me that not all believers are highly esteemed. It would imply to me that this is something special. This is a special expression of Daniel's closeness to God and God's closeness to him. You do realize that God is closer to some believers than others, don't you? Certainly the scripture teaches that. One such place is James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So if we're not drawing near to God, we shouldn't think that we have the same relationship to God and the same closeness to God that someone who is on a more consistent basis. Why was Daniel blessed the way he was? Why did he experience these things? Uh, and certainly the sovereignty of God is always involved, but there's also the reality that God responds to us. And the more we draw closer to him, and the more we draw closer to him in prayer, the more we live for him, the more we keep ourselves pure in our walk with God, the more we're going to experience of God and a closer communion to God. God certainly wants us all to be in this same place. He loves us and he certainly treasures us in that sense of his love, but to be this close that God would honor us with the kind of ministry opportunities and the kind of blessings that Daniel had. God certainly wants that communion with us, but it's part of it is up to us. Part of it is up to us. You and I have a part to play in that equation. Certainly a major part of that is our prayer. Just like in your human relationships, if you're not engaging people, if you're not um, communing with them, talking to them on a regular basis, you're not going to have as close a relationship as you do with those that you do that with. But having seen the connection between Daniel's character and this praying, now I want us to notice God's personal provision. Verse 21 through 23. How often do you think of angelic involvement in your prayer life? But that's exactly what we see happening in Daniel, both in this chapter and the next. And we will just touch on next, uh, ne uh, the next chapter just briefly. Not much at all, because I want to save it for next time. But I think it's important that as we view this, this interaction... And this reality that prayer involves angelic ministry to us, I think it's important to make a couple quick observations and reminders about the ministry of angels. And the first one is this, angels are never to be prayed to or worshipped, ever. I'd go so far as to say that, I'm not a, let's, let me just say this, I'm not a big fan of any kind of a, like angel pictures or whatever, uh, symbols or whatever. I, 
Angels do not receive glory. Ever. In fact, we see in Scripture them, them rejecting that very passionately. Notice what Colossians 2.18 says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Going on in detail about visions and puffed up, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Revelation 19.10, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So even though angels are involved in, in ministry and in prayer, we are engaging angels in some way to assist us and God uses them in various ways to minister to us. We are never to replace God with angels as so often we see people doing it. Uh, often you'll, you'll see people who are spiritual but not biblical actually worshiping and, and doing posts or uh, whatever about angels. So I think it's important for us to understand angelic ministry, but I don't think it's wise for us to focus on them that much. However, the second point I wanted to make before we get into the actual personal provision outline is that angels do actively serve God by ministering to his children. Hebrews 1, 13 and 14 says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Now their ministry isn't limited to bringing us answers to prayer, but it is an active part of, of their ministry to us. Notice that Gabriel's ministry to Daniel was purposeful. It was purposeful. Verse 21 and 22, while I was still speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. If we want to appreciate the full measure of God's purpose in sending Gabriel, we must remember what Daniel was praying about. Motivated, as you go back to the beginning of this chapter, motivated by Jeremiah's prophecy of the captivity of God's people, that it would last for 70 years, and Daniel's praying about that. He's no doubt trying to understand it all. Daniel's been praying on behalf of his people, and what is his specific prayer? More than anything, is the people's need for forgiveness. And they weren't repentant. We talked about that last week. There was nothing about what Israel was doing or what the tribe of Judah was doing at that time that deserved or should have expected any kind of forgiveness. But Daniel was actively praying for that forgiveness and that God would fulfill his promises to them. And so as Gabriel comes... One of the first things we see Gabriel doing is his purpose to ensure Daniel of God's forgiveness. Now that doesn't jump right out at you in the passage, but I believe it's the implied point of when, or the timing of when Gabriel came to him. The end part of verse 21, it says that Gabriel came to him about the time of the evening offering. Why does Daniel tell us that? wasn't like he was making an offering. There's no temple. He's in Babylon. There is no worship. There is no, he's worshiping in prayer, but there's no evening sacrifices going on. He's not in Jerusalem. But Gabriel comes to him at the exact time that you would be, if you were in Jerusalem, offering a sacrifice of a lamb for the forgiveness of sins. I don't think that timing is coincidental. I think it's purposeful. Daniel's praying about God's people being forgiven, and Gabriel comes to him at the time of the evening offering. And then, of course, he's going to give him content. He's going to give him instruction. But this was the time in the Jewish day that the unblemished lamb, which foreshadowed the death of Christ for the sins of the world, that would be offered at the temple. So forgiveness of Israel's sin was exactly what Daniel had been praying for. 
And I believe that Gabriel's visit was to assure him that that, in fact, was taking place, not just by the timing, but secondly, by the detailed information about how God would deliver this forgiveness. Verse 22, he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. And the insight and understanding is verses 24 through verse 27. And notice what it says in verse 24. We'll get back in more detail next time, but notice verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. I'd say that's a pretty good encouragement about the forgiveness of his people. Now we'll get into that, all the details of that later, but I think we all probably know that verse 24 and 25 are detailing the coming of Christ. In fact, giving the exact time of his, of his coming in the sense of the, the information of verse 25 literally uh, gives the exact timing of Christ offering himself as the king of Israel. And what we usually think of as Palm Sunday. Can you imagine how comforting this information was to Daniel? To be told that yes, God is going to finish the transgression. He's going to make atonement for iniquity. He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. In other words, Daniel, God's promises to you God's promises to all of your people are still going to be fulfilled. Not only was he encouraged that they would be fulfilled, he gets this amazing detailed prophecy in regards to how and when it was going to happen. Remember verse 17 Daniel's part of his prayer request in verse 17 was, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Jerusalem was in ruins. The temple was destroyed. And Gabriel makes clear that that temple was going to be rebuilt. That there was going to be a time in prophetically 70 weeks or 77s, which we'll detail next time, that the anointing of the most holy place would happen. In other words, Daniel, this isn't the end. What you saw when you left Jerusalem as a child and all the destruction and all the devastation, the fact that you can't now bring sacrifices to the Lord in the temple, that's going to be taken care of. Christ is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. The temple is going to be rebuilt. And God's full plan for your people is going to be accomplished. What we want to really focus on this morning, since we're not going through all those details, is just to appreciate the awesome purposes of God, the wonderful way he cares about our concerns and answers our prayers. He cares about Daniel's troubled spirit. He cares about Daniel's question. And he gives him, and by doing so, gives his people who would listen once Daniel starts uh, communicating this message, um, he cares about encouraging them and letting them know that he still loves them and he's going to provide for them. So Gabriel's visit was purposeful. Also, it was very personal. Obviously, a, a visit like this couldn't be anything but personal. But notice... Verse 21, it says, He gave me instruction and talked with me. Excuse me, I'm reading the wrong verse. Verse 21, While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision previously, came to me. The King James Version translates this, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me. And that is the literal Hebrew rendering of the word that is, that is translated here in the New American Standard, came to me. It literally is that of a touch, a reaching out. I believe that that reaching out in part was to give Daniel strength and comfort 
Uh, just glance over it real quickly in chapter 10, verse 10, we see the same kind of thing. This is not the same event. This is not even the same year. We know that by verse 1, but it says, Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this to me, I stood up trembling. We see another situation where Daniel's greatly troubled, he, he can't even stand, and the angel reaches out and touches him and gives him strength and encourages him to stand up. You know, prayer accomplishes many things, one of which is the comfort and strength that God can give us. You're not going to feel physically an angel touch you. But we certainly, I hope, have all experienced the, the peace and the strengthening and the comfort that comes as a result of prayer. And it doesn't always just flood into our souls while we are praying. But a lot of times, as I have really, really struggled, you ever have days where you just feel like you're under a dark cloud and you, you, just, you don't even have any reason to know why? I'm not talking about bad news comes and, and you're troubled. Yeah, that's, that makes sense to us. But I'm talking about those days where it's like, you just feel an overwhelming sadness. And sometimes when I've experienced that, it's really hard for my brain to even work. I, it's hard for me to study. It's hard for me to accomplish things. And so I just pray and I pray and I don't usually feel greatly encouraged during my prayer time. But you know what? God slowly takes away that, that whatever that is, oppression, whether it's, it's satanic oppression or, or just you know, physical, normal discouragement or whatever it is, I don't know, but he enables me to function, enables me to get through, and you know what? Always, without a doubt, the next day is just the opposite. Sometimes the second half of the day is just the opposite. God does comfort us and strengthen us, physically strengthen us, not just spiritually strengthen us. And angels are a part of that. I think that's an important part of their role, even though we don't understand how they do it. We don't see them doing it. But a key to it is simply spending time in his presence and casting our cares upon him. As Daniel came to God and was in extreme weariness, God encouraged him and strengthened him. And in prayer, you have that opportunity to have a personal communion, a personal touch, if I can use that expression. I don't like to use those mystical expressions the touch of God upon your life, just like you have encouragement when you fellowship with people and you, you have that time of refreshment. That's what God allows us to do in prayer. Thirdly, the answer to Daniel's prayer was prompt. Very interesting expression here in verse 23. Because we don't know how long Daniel had been praying, but it seems to me he'd been praying for a while. I don't think that verses 5 through 18 is everything there was in the prayer. It could be. But I want you to notice when Gabriel was, Gabriel expresses the answer or the command for him to go to Daniel and to minister to him and to bring him the answer. It was at the beginning of your supplications, verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Now, Gabriel doesn't say he came at the beginning, but the command was given at the beginning. And a matter of fact, chapter 10 is going to demonstrate to us a, a certain clear uh, delay in prayer, but the same type of principle that it was immediately once Daniel started praying that God heard and started delivering, if you will, the answer. But it may have been hours. In this context, it wouldn't have been longer than that. Between the time the command was issued by God to Gabriel to go in the time that he actually had this encounter with Gabriel. 
We all know that sometimes you can pray for a long time about something. So long that it seems like that prayer is never going to be answered, but God's Word assures us that as soon as God's people, the right heart for God, start praying to Him, He hears us. And He and His plan and He and His sovereignty and His providence begins uh, bringing the answer, even though it may be that we have to wait some time before we experience it. And this prompt answer leads to one of the most amazing and specific prophecies ever recorded regarding the ministry of Jesus Christ. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end, there will be war, and desolations are determined. And he'll make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Obviously that's a lot, and I'm not covering it today. I just wanted to scare you by reading it all. But uh, the bottom line of the message is that Daniel, God is going to forgive. And God's going to bring an end to all the sin. He's going to bring an end to all that right now troubles us and distresses us. He's going to bring in righteousness. He's going to redeem his people. He, he will fulfill his promises. He will set up his kingdom. And you and I need to trust that same message. This life, with all of its struggles, with all of its sin, with all of the evil that is, exists, is going to end. It's going to give way to the kingdom of God. And you and I are going to enjoy that forever. So folks, as we wrap up this morning, just again, just to emphasize the main thing I want to bring out from this is that God loves you and I as much as he loves Daniel. He wants to be as close to us as he was to Daniel. Doesn't mean he's going to give you dreams. Doesn't mean Gabriel's going to at least visibly come to you and minister to you, but his angels are ministering to us. He does love us. He does care about us. He is hearing our prayers, and he wants us to commune with him so that he can even draw closer to us and commune with us. What happens when godly people pray? A lot. A lot. Taking us right back to the verse that we started with this morning, James 5, 16, the end of that verse. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. So let's be righteous people. Let's fervently pray. Let's bring our nation and our president and our rulers, our leaders to prayer. Let's bring our church to in our community daily in prayer. Let's bring our school in prayer. Let's bring those people that you know that God has given you a special burden for daily in prayer and watch God do great things. Because he wants to do great things. He wants to use you as a part of those great things. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these just few little verses in the middle of this amazing passage of Scripture. I pray that it's been helpful to us to just focus on them this morning. We're about to engage next week in just a really amazing prophecy and certainly one with a lot of details in it. I just pray that you would encourage us to understand this morning the, the wonderful opportunity we have to bring needs to you, to be intercessors to bring others before you in prayer, other needs, our nation's needs, Israel's needs, the world's needs, and to watch you do great things on our, 
on our behalf and for your glory. We ask that you'll help us to be those godly people that will pray and watch you do great things. We ask these things in Jesus' name.